Welcome back to episode two of Side Out with VNS. We're talking to Michelle Wood and Dan Oda and continuing our conversation from episode one. In part two of our conversation, we'll hear their thoughts on coaching philosophy, seasonal planning, practice planning, and drill planning. We're kind of sliding into uh, some coaching philosophy talks, which is philosophy that when someone when someone first asked me this, I remember philosophy sounded like a terrifying word. I'm like, I'm not a philosopher. Like, I don't, my God, I don't, I don't know what that, that means. I don't know what I want to say. Um, and still to this day, I, I never seem to have a very succinct answer for this question. Uh, I tend to, to ramble. So, um, you know, what are your guys' thoughts on, on having a, a coaching philosophy? What do you, do you think it's important? Do you think it's something that coaches should be considering? And, uh, and maybe how, how that evolves. Michelle, do you want to start us off? Yeah, you're right. It's it's a scary word. And for some reason, we're all intimidated by it because it's like there is a right or wrong answer. It's like, sorry, where am I supposed to? How many coaches have Googled what is a coaching philosophy or examples of a coaching philosophy? And they're trying to find something to steal. But the reality is that I do think it's important. I do think it's something that should guide you and guide your decisions. And I don't think it has to be something that is volleyball specific. Um, I think it does evolve. I don't think it has to be something that stays stationary the entire time because the reality is we as people evolve and the types of athletes that we're coaching, best, you know, they evolve as well. So um, I think it's important. I think it helps guide you. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's, it's often based on my values and, and how, it, how I'm going to shape my decisions. Yeah. Dan, thoughts on a coaching philosophy? Well, I think your actions basically are a reflection of your coaching philosophy. So people like coaches probably, yeah, if, they're, if they are scared about thinking about it, they just don't understand that they're already embodying their, their coaching philosophy or their values. Um, you know, maybe there's a bit of a distinction between the two, but um, I think the there there needs to be some deliberate reflection on on what is important to you because those things are probably reflected in your your actions and, and your words every day uh to, every time you're on the court with with athletes and um, having that clear in your mind and then making sure that your actions follow from that um and then being able to articulate that clearly to your to your to your athletes is, is extremely important yeah i think uh I agree. Like val so I'm hearing values. I'm hearing like a correlation between your your val your your beliefs and your actions. And I think that's where where coaches can find themselves in a sticky situation sometimes is when when what they say and what they do doesn't necessarily um, match, and that can create some confusion or or potentially even some conflict within within teams. Um, if you were gonna tell me today on May 14th what what your coaching philosophy is or, or what it embodies. Um, you know, how does that sound today? And I, I'm sure I could ask you in a year from now and maybe like you said, Michelle, that's evolved. But today, Michelle, what's your what's your coaching philosophy? Yeah, I, I base it off of a people first mentality. Like at the end of the day, I'm working with student athletes. And if I want them to thrive and, and succeed, I need to think of them as human beings first before I can get the athlete to be successful. And then I have to remember that I'm here to maximize passions and that includes my own. And one of the reasons I went into coaching at the same time as I was hired at Acadia University, I was also hired within the Toronto District School Board. And that took some time to get into that pathway and I had to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And I thought people aren't always passionate about education or, or you know, studying things in school, but when people make the decision to pursue mm -hmm. a sport, chances are they're really passionate about it. So it's my responsibility to make sure I'm maximizing that passion. So when I'm looking at things that I value, it's work ethic and it's attention to detail. Those two things will formulate every decision or what I'm trying to accomplish based on whether or not uh, you know the work ethic is there and whether or not they're focusing on the process through that attention to detail, which if we look at how, how does my coaching philosophy evolve? Well, right now I'm kind of looking at, we're in a generation where patience and uh, instant gratification is something that our student athletes are, are struggling with. They, they want the answer now. They want the result now. They don't want to be a part of this process. So how, how do I involve that now in my coaching philosophy and, and consent some of my decisions moving forward? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Dan? What are your, what's, what's your current coaching philosophy in 2020? 
I don't think it's changed that much. Maybe the way I articulate it might, might have changed. Um, but um, I think to kind of reiterate uh, Michelle's point about work, uh, work ethic, I think mean, that's always been a fairly simple formula. Um, the problem is that I don't think most people, and, and by people I also include athletes, really understand how hard you got to work. You know, and this is often the the thing that separates average to from from like the the really good or the really good to the the best uh, is how hard you really have to work. And 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 I think even if you realize it at some point, you're not willing to to go there. Uh, it's just too hard. And this is what separates you know the Michael Jordans and the Kobe Bryant's from you know the rest of the people that are trying to do what they do or or think that they're doing what they do. Um, I would say excellence. Um, to me, uh, time is finite. So if you're going to spend time doing something, like you better, you, you might as well do it well and do it really well uh, if you want to be really good at it. So I, I hate it when we waste time. Um, I tell, I say this to my uh, team all the time, or hopefully not all the time, but whenever I feel like we're wasting each other's time. It's like if we're if we're not here, we're not committed to, to doing this and, and, and look like we're committed to each other, then then we're just wasting everyone's time and we should probably just go home and find something, uh, something else to do with our time. Um, so to me, that's that's extremely important. And I think something that I I probably articulate differently now, and I certainly say this to, to players uh, a lot now, is uh, really understanding that you know what defines us in our setting is, is kind of our ability to make people around us better so I think as, as, a, as it pertains to a coaching philosophy I try to teach that but I also feel like I play a huge role in that um, I don't coach because you know it's a it's a financially lucrative career I don't coach because I, I, I get all these plaques um, uh, you know, and go on, again, I'll go on the occasional podcast or whatever like this. Um, no, I coach because I, I feel like I'm making a fairly important impact in, in a, an important part of a lot of these people's lives. And sometimes I get it wrong. I don't do a very good job at it. And then sometimes I, I get it right. And hopefully I get it right more often than not. Um, but, you know, I think that's the most rewarding part of the job for me is when I, you know, reconnect with some of our grads five, six years down the road and see what they've done. And, and most of the time, it's really impressive. And if I feel like I've had even just a little bit uh, of, uh, to do with that, then I feel like, you know, that's something that I take a lot of pride in and something that if I'm going to do it, I, I want to do it really well. So, um, so yeah, so I think those are probably the three most important elements of my own coaching philosophy. Yeah, I think from from what both of you guys are saying, it reminds me of of a quote that I saw, and I'm not going to remember it exactly right, but I'll get the gist of it in the in the last dance. And they were talking about Michael Jordan and his extraordinary work ethic, and and the the quote went something like he would he was tough and he was demanding, but he would never ask something of me that he wouldn't he do wouldn't himself, do. Um, and something to that effect. And mm -hmm. and you know that sounds like that's that's a core element through both of your your coaching philosophies that if you're asking for work ethic, you're asking for, you know, excellence, then that's something that you both are putting forward uh, in your behaviors as well, so that your athletes aren't saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm working hard, but you're, you're doing half or you're doing less than. So, you know, yeah. being, being exemplar and being, uh, uh, modeling that in your behaviors, as we mentioned, and staying consistent with your message, what you do and what you, what you say, um, you know, seems to be a common thread for both of you. Yeah. And there's so many examples of, of this kind of mindset in books, um, you know, sweep the sheds or there's, there's a book um, it's chop the wood, carry the water. And in the book, the, the guy is trying to become a samurai and he doesn't understand why he's having to, you know, chop the wood, carry the water. And he's having to really embody all the work ethic and, and buy into the vision. And he's, he's told to build this house and he's, you know, half-assing it and doing all sorts of different things to build this house and doesn't realize at the end that the house he's building is something that he has to live in. And yeah. so just, just this mindset that you, you really do need to pull your weight and you need to work hard, not because of, of what the end result might be, but because you're valuing what you're doing in this moment and you're benefiting from the experience right now. Yeah. And I think, again, just kind of 
you know, I'm going to summarize what you guys said in terms of, of coaches who are either starting or trying to formulate, you know, what, what could this coaching philosophy look like? And just, so kind of looking within themselves, looking at their own values, what they believe is important. Um, and then being able to, to model that through, through their behavior and based on who's in front of them. Would that be yeah. a very, a very in a nutshell synopsis of kind of some of the things you guys mentioned? I, I would argue too, like maybe start backwards uh, in a sense of like, what do I do currently? And what does that kind of imply about my own coaching philosophy? And if you don't like where, you know, where that conclusion kind of leads you, then it's okay. So I need to reinvent that and then make sure my actions follow from, from that. And my regular activity is, is, is reflective and consistent with uh, what I want that philosophy to, to be. Yeah, sounds like lots of inward reflection and looking at, at yourself is, is a big part of that. Lots of time. Was a big part Now's of the that. time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now is the time. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Yeah, before we, before we talk about planning, just my, my two cents on the coaching philosophies, I find like a lot of um, a commonality I find in a lot of new coaches or like coaches that have just come from a playing career is, is they often equate the philosophy to like systems they're running. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I believe my philosophy is I want to run a fast offense. You know, my philosophy is I want to serve the ball this way. And, um, you know, I, I really appreciate how you both spoke to, you know, it's, it's really not about the volleyball. It's, it's about how you are as a person and, and how you communicate and, and how you want the world to see you and the effect you want to have on the people around you. Um, so good, great, good food for thought. Great job, guys. You're doing awesome. And John, and John, I don't, I don't think that, you know, like volleyball things can't be philosophies in themselves. Yeah. Like I think yeah. that's important to, to, to have those as well. But I think just the coaching context that Michelle and I work in, like we're getting in the opportunity to work with these student athletes for generally four to five years. So there has to be a bit more of a global long-term kind of philosophy that, that is there as well, not just a, a style of play. Mm -hmm. Agreed. All right, planning. Um, you know, we're going to kind of dip into, you know, seasonal planning, practice planning as a whole practice, and then just individual drills. But I'm going to ask you guys to kind of put your, your, your club coaching hats on. Uh, so you're speaking to the majority of folks that might, that might be watching this. Um, I mean, our reality in Nova Scotia and most provinces, our club system runs, you know, early January to the middle of May. So broadly, what are some important areas you would consider as a club head coach when you're creating seasonal plans for your programs? And we'll start with Dan. Um, well, whenever I'm planning, I, I kind of, first thing I do is I kind of open up the scheduling and the, kind of determine what are the, like the firm things that, that I can't move, you know, championships, um, you know, I guess in, in a VNS context, the super series dates and things like that. Um, and then everything else other than that is, is fairly flexible or has some, some degree of flexibility. So then I, I can then kind of work backwards from, you know, kind of the, the end of the season to kind of where I'm at currently and then determine, okay, where are some kind of key moments along the way. And then, it's just, I think from there, it's, it's a fairly simple process of like, okay, like if you're trying to peak uh, at one or multiple points in the season, then you need to prepare for that. You need to plan for that. You need to, to periodize for that. And I know periodization is a scary word for a lot of coaches, but it really isn't an overly complicated process. It's just planning, doing a little bit of planning even in terms of like how, how tired you want your group to be, if, if nothing else uh, is, is really important. I think um, the approach of just go, go, go from day one to, to the end of the season is like, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty, I think you're, if you get to where you're hoping for, you're going to be more lucky than, than anything. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's kind of the first uh, steps, I guess. Great. Michelle? I would echo what Dan said, and then you know, I think that's one of the most important things uh, to add on to that. 
we have to remember that these high school students are probably involved in multiple sports, especially within our province where their high school sport is very important. And that, you know, volleyball in school versus volleyball for club is, it operates different uh, on a different schedule, but doesn't mean they're not involved in basketball or badminton. And this is really important experiences for these student athletes. So what is the rest recovery and load are we asking these students for their, their whole schedule so that we can really balance demands and then when we're looking at our competition load, are we heavily pushing all of our open competition at one time period so they're competing every weekend and not getting a chance to recover um, is something that we want to consider. I do think that we have to make sure that we're scheduling in other things outside of just the volleyball technical stuff, uh, you know, having meetings with athletes, figuring out what the athlete's intention is, what do they want to try and work on, um, what are their goals? because we do find club programs have, or individual athletes have a mismatch of, of goals and objectives. Some are playing because they love playing volleyball, but they don't intend to pursue it at the next level. And then some programs have athletes on, on the roster where they really, they wanna make this a goal and objective for them. So making sure that, that the coaches understand what the athletes' intentions are, what their goals are, and how they can measure those throughout. And you can use Super Series as, um, the different phases to kind of track, okay, phase one, we hit super series one, did I accomplish what I wanted to accomplish? And it's a good check, check mark for our coaches and for athletes. So I think that's a thing that they can plan in their larger seasonal plans. Great, and you know, you both kind of brought some, some things to mind, but um, what are your general thoughts on just like a, a play, a, a practice versus play ratio? And I know that's gonna change versus age groups, but, uh, you know, what are some best practices or maybe things to avoid in your experiences for play, um, practice to, to play? Uh, Michelle? Yeah, I think if you overload too much competition, the athletes are ne never getting a chance to learn and try new things because obviously we're, we're competitive. When, when you hop onto a competition court, you don't want to try the new thing that you're not going to execute well and, and perform poorly. So chances are you're not developing that new thing that you need to have for down the road. Uh, so I think there's got to be a balance. Um, however, athletes love competition. That's what drives them. They, they love playing that. So figuring out a way maybe to partner with another club and do um, exhibition where maybe it's every Sunday you compete, but there's one competition court and maybe there's a practice or learning facilitated. And maybe when they hop, they, they learn something on this court and then hop over to this court and can implement it into the play. And maybe that's the success, success criteria. I think you've got to find a way to balance. Otherwise, these athletes don't develop the technical skills or the tactical skills that they need to progress because so much is uh, focused on performance and compete. Dan, anything to add on that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think Michelle's last point is, is something that um, typically comes up in a conversation about planning, um, particularly in a, in a club context. Um, but even in our context, like if we were to step back and say, okay, like uh, what's our training to competition ratio? And that's, you know, the appropriate amount of each is going to fluctuate over the course of the season, of course. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think the context that I see at least or, or what I see in, in our province uh, most often, especially in high school, is like you're, you're playing in a tournament every weekend. And, you know, based on what, what, we, what we read in LTAD, like it's for you to be competing that much, you should be training you know, four to five times a week, um, which I think would be unrealistic for most of these uh, athletes, um, whether they're playing other sports or just don't have access to the gym time or, or whatever. Um, you know, I, I certainly understand the value of competition for, for, for what you're trying to do in the course of the season and, and its role in, in development. But I think even that in itself, like, um, if I think if coaches really scrutinize what they were trying to get out of competition versus, um, you know, maybe foregoing opportunities to train and then being able to evaluate the, um, the merits of each at, at various points in the season, I think maybe at least they're going to make, make more informed decisions as opposed to just doing what everyone else is doing and signing up in as many tournaments 
months as, as possible. Uh, that would be my advice. Uh, having said that, I, I'm not a club coach anymore, and I feel like club volleyball has changed a little bit since since I coached it. So um, there's probably a few things that I'm not aware of. But so no, that's my great. Impression. Great, and uh, you know, I think you know. Again, Michelle said something that sparked a, a thought: is that I, th I think competition doesn't have to be, you know, wear wear your uniform, wear your weekend tournament, you know either having like multiple teams in a gym at the same time it competition can be just putting a scoreboard at practice. Um, you know, um, how, how you engineer your training. Um, and, and then it, if you're having some exhibition opportunities with some other clubs and like a, a competition slash training, then, you know, that's fantastic. So just kind of being creative that it doesn't, you don't always have to spend money to stay overnight at a hotel and, and travel and, and have like a 12 team tournament, like, Competi the definition of competition is, is maybe broader than sometimes we, we think. So that's great. Thank you guys. Um, I guess for both of you, like how, how locked into a plan are you? You spend all this time, you know, preseason creating a plan. Um, you know, have you guys changed plans like mid midstream and like, what would be some reasons that, uh, you know, you might, you might change to, to something else. Dan. Well, I think any plan that doesn't have some flexibility in it is, is, is probably not going to work too well. Um, even I think in your best plans are generally going to have some, some things that need to be adjusted. Um, some pretty obvious examples for me would be injury. Um, so, you know, within a team training environment, every athlete is going to be loaded, you know, slightly differently. Um, this, you're going to see this probably more exaggerated examples of this in, in kind of individual sports like track or swimming. Um, but in our context, even like guys that are coming off an injury. Um, and I think we have tools now like, like vert that kind of can monitor, you know, um, the load on, on athletes. And, um, and so you have to be very conscious of that, uh, athletes that are playing, um, you know, more on weekends, uh, in our situation. Uh, tend to need more recovery time during the week. Um, and some athletes just, just need more recovery in general. Uh, there are individual differences to that. So I think athlete as an extension, or sorry, injuries as an extension of, of that, that idea is definitely something that you have to be able to pr be prepared to adjust to. Um, obviously, if you're getting, if you collect data, and I wouldn't necessarily expect a lot of coaches to collect uh, data, uh, maybe the, the same way we do, um, where we're training these athletes almost every day, uh, or competing every day, um, then, you know, that data might tell you that, you know, what your, how you are loading or training these athletes, um, it may not have had the desired outcomes in terms of like their fatigue levels or whatever you're, you're looking at. So those are always reasons to, to change, um, training loads as far as like the actual content of your sessions in terms of what you're working on well i think there's there has to be a, a bit more of a global plan uh a long-term plan what how you're kind of layering different aspects of the game throughout the the course of the season but you're also always gonna have some sort of a, a recency effect in terms of like man we got killed in this part of the game and we're playing this team and they're going to see the tape on that and they're going to try to expose the same thing so there's always going to be some element uh, of that in, in incorporated into games and and maybe for the club coach that you might be playing six or seven different teams in a weekend maybe maybe super series is different maybe you're only playing a couple teams but um in in, in a university context like you're preparing for one or two teams every week um so it's like you're prepping based on what you know of that opponent they're prepping on you you're anticipating that they're going to do this et cetera, et cetera. so there's always going to be an element of that so I'm not sure if that's flexibility so much as just like part of kind of the process that, that you're expecting. But I think along the way, I mean, very few teams are going to go through a year and say, you know, everything went exactly the way we anticipated. So we're just going to continue to, to go on this plan and, and you know, uh, we can beat, we're going to beat everybody with this, with this way of playing the game or whatever. Right. So uh, I don't think that's a very realistic situation. And even I think in a club context, uh, most coaches are going to, uh, reflect on you know the last competition they had and and take away a number of things that they thought they did well and, and things that they want to get better at and, and I think as long as you have kind of like a uh, you know a global 
understanding of where you're trying to go uh, and feel like you can get there, just make a few modifications along the way. And if you don't check every box, that's okay, that's okay too. I think that's just part of the reality of what you're doing. Good. Michelle, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, just, uh, I mean, for those that have been in the gym with me, they know I have a pamphlet on me at all times that is my, you know, my coaching, my practice plan of some kind. And I think it's important that you plan. And I think it's also important that you're, you have the ability to pivot. And pivot has been a huge word for me that if something's not going the way you intended it to go, that it is okay to stop it and make adjustments. You can make adjustments on the fly. You can refer to your, your pamphlet practice plan during a water break to see how can I build on this, make this better. Or you may continue because growth is happening faster or slower than, than desired. So you may stay in a drill or build on it because it's either working really well or you wanna adjust some parameters and be better at it. And then we also have to remember that every day, we don't know what kind of athletes are gonna show up in our gym and they're student athletes. So sometimes there's the mental component of them being physically and, and mentally, emotionally exhausted. So what you had planned may not be the time for it. So just, just being able to pivot is important. Great. And Dan, you, I mean, I guess you both mentioned monitoring athletes. So if I'm a club coach and asking you for advice about how can I monitor athletes in the daily training environment, but I don't, I don't have a vert system, I don't have $2,000, could you maybe suggest uh, one or two simple ways that a coach can be a little bit more aware or track maintenance or, or athlete maintenance, Dan? Right. Uh, I think it's, it's, it can also just be as simple as, uh, you know, having some sort of tool to just measure like um, fatigue at an internal level. So we, we also use like, um, uh, like a daily survey where where athletes are asked uh, to rate a number of different things and one of them is fatigue and um, you know there's sometimes discrepancy between athletes but over the course of time like you you find out kind of what the what the average is for each person and then you can see if you're they're having a particularly tough day or, or not um, and, and also just having conversations with with people I think even with all the tools that we use like uh, having regular chats about about this and that and, and trying to get a better handle of all the other uh, external things that are that are happening around and outside of the volleyball court uh, which may impact you know kind of what they're capable of doing on in a particular session I think is is, is really important so some of those things don't cost money it's just it's time and so I think just being mindful of that, understanding, you know, and then having some ability to kind of predict uh, certain periods of the season where it's going to get hard, uh, whether it's the academic um, stressors or if, you know, a number of your athletes are playing this other sport in for their school and knowing that they have a, a busy time up and then you know, being able to accommodate for, for those types of things. Um, I think you can probably avoid a lot of uh, conflict that, that we have more information and information is just things that you can ask for. Great. Thank you. Um, we're going to, we're going to pop into uh, in, like an individual practice plan. Um, you know, the, you may have kind of addressed this already in talking about a seasonal plan, but what would be some things that you as a coach would, would be thinking about would be going around in your head, you know, as you sit down to plan out a, a practice, what are some important, what are some important nuggets for each of you? Michelle, let's start with you. Have intention has to be the first one. Know what your, your plan is and, and stop. Don't have the drill be the first thing that you're trying to think of, have the intention first and then create the parameters around that. Um, make sure that you give your athletes some time to meet in positional groups to set some intention about what they're trying to accomplish. And that way, during water breaks, that they can hold themselves accountable to that. Um, I think that it's important to think about uh, load and when do your athletes get rest and how many times are are they in the air jumping? And with club volleyball programs, I, you often have maybe 10 athletes 
So if you're running a two hour practice, well, how often has that one middle blocker that's shown up to practice jumped? And so I think if you're organized with your practice back to the load and what are the simple ways, create small parameters, make sure it's not just we're doing this for time, but we're doing three rounds. 10 times each. Once you do 10, you rotate. And we're, we're going to do that three times so that you have a specific idea of what they're trying to accomplish. And then last thing that I would say is make sure that you allocate reflection time. You've got to know at the end of the day, did your athletes accomplish what they wanted to accomplish? And did you do that as well? So reflect and look at your plan. Great. Dan? Yeah, I guess I would probably just step back um, and maybe explain kind of what my process would look like for the week instead of just like on, on any specific day because um, what my method usually involves is uh, looking back at the past weekend, usually following competition, um, and then having the first part of that first practice back as, as a bit of a reflection time and, and, and my players are, are pretty versed in, in kind of the, the metrics that I'm looking at and they know what our internal standards are. Uh, they're usually part of that uh, process and defining what those standards are. And then we can determine whether we met, you know, our goals in, in those areas. And then using that as kind of a, a springboard for setting out the purpose and the, 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 the goals for that week. And then in any particular day is like, what are we doing uh, within that kind of theme that we have set out for ourselves for that, that week, that month, whatever. And then um, as Michelle said, having real clear intention of, of what we're doing that day, what are we, you know, we're not just going and going through the, the motions here. Um, some of our activities may look very similar to what we did last week, but you know, like why are we doing this today and what are the exact tools or methods that, that we have for today and what's gonna be the expectation. So I think if we have always clearly uh, uh, define a goal or, or, or outcome that we're, we're seeking um, and then uh, provide a very clear idea of like how we're gonna do it and then insist and demand from each other the, the, the work and the, uh, the commitment to, to, to achieving that, um, you know, generally you're, you're kind of putting, putting that in a very clear and concise way and not to say that, it works uh, to success every every time, but as I'm sure Michelle would agree, that's that it is part of the process is going through a practice, having uh, a lousy practice in, on on a number of occasions, but being able to reflect on that as well, and and saying, well, how how can we have a better practice next time, knowing what what went on uh, today or yesterday and so I think that's kind of the, the, the method that I use and and how a day fits in just it's part of a week guys know what our plan is for that week I communicate that it's okay this is what we're looking at doing Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday or you know and here's kind of the corresponding workloads that you can expect here's the days that we got our workouts um, so everyone knows uh, what's expected each day and they know like today is a short practice but we got to go full out for for 90 minutes or 75 minutes. And um, there might be a workout that they've just finished before that, but they know that they're not like, you know, kind of cruising through the workout knowing that they gotta, you know, they might have to go for a really hard practice the, that later that evening. They, they know what practice is gonna look like. I, I find it just being very clear with those things in most cases. Great. Um, I guess kind of my last, you know, question uh, in that planning thing. You talked a little bit about seasonal, about practice, but you know, talking about the individual drills um, that we might have in a practice, whether that's you know one, two, three, or four drills in whatever amount of time you you have. Um, what would you say would be some best practices or piece of pieces of advice when planning a specific drill? Uh, if you were speaking to a club coach, Michelle. There's so many things that you could say with this, but the one thing that I'll um, pick up on because I, I think it's so important is that everybody has to have a purpose when they're in a when they're in a specific drill. And sometimes we could be working on serve receive, and so the middles get left out. So what is the middles focus when that's happening? And every athlete should know what their role is and what their goals are. 
And then the second part to that is what is your role and what are you watching and what are you responsible for and what are you giving feedback on? Because sometimes as coaches, when a drill's going on, we step too far back and then we're not providing the feedback that we need to, or we're too narrowly focused and we're not sure what we're providing feedback on because we're all over the place. So make sure each positional athlete has a role in their drill and make sure that you have clarity over what your role is in the drill. Great. Dan? I thought that was a great answer, Michelle. Thanks, Dan. Which means I was probably going to say the same thing. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I guess on a, on a slightly different uh, angle, um, I think just being very deliberate about what you're covering every practice. Um, I would venture uh, I guess that uh, a lot of practices look to say that's that's not a good thing in and of itself but i think the the purpose of what you're doing has to be very clearly defined um you know i think any any drill that incorporates serving and passing is 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 really important but even within a serving and passing practice like i i, I would say there are a lot that i've seen that are really good and there's probably some that that aren't as good because of you know one or two things that I see happening in the drill itself whether there's some element of what they're doing that's not very realistic or it has too many people standing around doing nothing or you know like you know kind of with a shell right if they're just serving okay and then like kind of common sense would would indicate your mills are usually should always be your best servers well I think our experience would say that they're usually at tied for the worst servers on the on the team which is very inconsistent with the volume of serving they're having so and i've been guilty of this too having guys on a team that that are generally our worst servers coming up positions that serve the most in practice so there there there's an implied uh, lack of you know maybe purpose or clarity in what they're what they're working on and and maybe some accountability for for that as well so um i think that all those things play into it um I think that, you know, certainly in a, in a club context, uh, I think being able to link things together, certainly as the season goes on, um, trying to uh, practice skills in combination, in other words, not practicing skills in isolation. Uh, and I, I'm sure most of this gets covered in coaching, uh, coaching courses nowadays. But, uh, but I mean, I can tell you coaching at a university level, if you're if if a drill you're doing doesn't involve um, reception of some sort uh, of a, an actual reception skill by a player, um, I don't feel like there's a there's there's maximum value to that to that drill because if you can't pass the ball at any level, you're 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 really you're limiting your ability to to score points in a in a real severe way. So um, I think passing is as important as any as at any level um, and I, I can certainly speak to that uh, at our level so um, every drill generally has to have that first contact and hopefully coming off some sort of serve or attack or whatever uh, from a live player on the other side great yeah and like my you know my experience with like drill planning you know personally as well as with a lot of coaches I get to work with uh, in Nova Scotia is you as a new coach you're always doing the drills that were done to you like you coached how you were coached and there's not a, you know, like a mindfulness to what you're doing. It's just, that's, that's volleyball. And then, you know, you start, maybe you start to get really creative. So you went from being a cook who just cooked from the cookbook to being a chef who starts to like experiment with some different uh, ingredients and start to create their own recipe, which I, you know, there's, I think there's a lot of benefits in that and kind of, you know, you're doing something for a reason and like a lot of cooking, yeah, there's lots of failure. Uh, lots of recipes that don't taste great, but I mean, you figure it out, you figure out what you have to adjust. And like, personally, I'm just coming around to, uh, you know, when like five years ago, I would have said, like, I just created, I created drills and thought it was great. But the downside of that is like every drill was new to the athletes and it took them half the drill to learn to drill. So the learning of the skill, like the time was just so diminished. So, um, you know, you, I've heard a lot of coaches, both in Nova Scotia and, you know, internationally just talk about like, they don't have a lot of drills. And I think it was in Ottawa at the symposium that uh, Dan and you and I were both at. And I can't remember which coach it was. It might've been Gerbich from Serbia, but it was like, how many, how many drills do you do? And he might've said like 
six, you know, six or seven. And his point was like maybe the framework of the drill looked pretty similar for those six or seven drills, but obviously there's an infinite amount of, of little tweaks you can do within drills, like how a ball is entered, you know, how many points you need, um, whatever technical or tactical focus you have. Um, but that's been a big aha moment for me is like, you know, some less is more. Uh, mm -hmm. Now the athletes can just like work on the skill they're working on because they know, like they know the drill. Um, which you guys might have figured out a long time ago, but uh, you John, know. you just uh, summarized my my coaching and my cooking there because <laughs> never follow a recipe. I'm like a little bit of this, a little bit of that, <laughs> and see what comes out. And let's just say my meals aren't always great. <laughs> well, I know Dan's an expert cook, so uh, he's. <laughs> I, I wish we're still that were waiting true. for the invitation. Yeah. I wish that were true, John. I can make something that tastes good to me, but that's. <laughs> That's highly subjective. All right, fair enough. But no, I appreciate your thoughts on planning, guys. Um, so Michelle and Dan, we're, we're almost at the end of our time together. So we have a few final um, questions for you both. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna shoot this one out to both of you. Um, what would be two to three kind of top pieces of advice um, for all of our, our membership that's out there watching, um, you know, specifically directed at coaches if if you could give them you know if if you take nothing else away take this away what what would it be uh anybody want to want to jump in first yeah i'll go ahead i i think the number one thing that i can say is ask as many questions as you possibly can get in as many people's gym as you possibly can and and keep exploring avenues to make yourself uncomfortable so that you can get better uh, there is no right way so trust trust that you're always uh trying to explore something that's going to be good for your athletes good for your program and good for yourself and um just make sure that you always have intention great thanks dan uh, I think just to kind of, um, as an offshoot of what Michelle just said, is the, the step after that, which is having a real clear understanding of why you do everything that you do. Uh, I find that younger coaches, um, and I certainly uh, was, was um, guilty of doing this in my coaching career when I was younger as well, is just, you just you just kind of try to just copy what other people are doing. People that, you know, presumably you would respect or think this is, this is a good coach. So if they're doing it, it's obviously good enough for me without really going through a, a very important step of like, why are they doing this? And why is it appropriate for them? Um, just because this coach does it or that coach does it doesn't mean that it's appropriate for you. It doesn't even mean it's a necessarily a good drill in it, in itself. I've seen some great coaches running drills that I, I personally didn't think had a lot of value. Um, and probably, you know, uh, at this point in my career, I could have that conversation with, with those coaches to, to really dig into the why that they're doing these things. Um, but I, I think that, you know, I have too many conversations with, with coaches that basically revolve around, you know, like, I'm doing this because so-and-so, I saw so-and-so do it. And they'll preface it by saying, I got this drill from so-and-so. With the You're giving implied, credit, but. With the implied, <laughs> well, but the, the implication is that it's awesome because this coach is awesome, yeah. right? And, uh, you know, I see that even in, in some of the, the coaching kind of websites now and even mm -hmm. like uh, Gold Medal Squared, which, you know, should be, and I, I, maybe I shouldn't be saying this in a, in this kind of context, but they're, they're, you know, the, the intent, original intent was, is, is very research driven. And I think there's still a lot of stuff on their website that, that is that, but then even if that information's there, like coaches will just go to that website, um, grab a drill and just say, well, it's on gold medal squared. Therefore it's awesome. Without really context. understanding, without understanding any of the science behind why this is this may or may not be a, a good drill right and and i guess you know in line with that like it there's no shortcut for this like you really have to educate yourself you know that was why i did my master's degree um and got you know a lot more educated on concepts like motor learning like biomechanics like physiology um 
so that, you know, when I talk about biomechanics of a jump, whatever, um, I have some basic understanding of, of the science behind that. When we talk about, you know, how people learn or effectively learn uh, versus other methods, like there's, there's some under scientific understanding of that. So we can talk about, you know, random practice and, and, and have, you know, an actual understanding what that actually means. Um, whereas like, I think a lot of people don't want to put the time in. It's easier for them to just watch somebody or have someone tell them um, to do this without really understanding the why of it. So I think that would be probably my, my most important point. And then I guess my other point would be uh, watch, watch as, as much high level volleyball as you can. Um, you know, I'm lucky I, I can watch international volleyball um, through uh, an app, uh, volumetrics app that, that Michelle has access to as well. And it, it lets us watch like the top professional players in the world, national teams, things like that. Um, but I mean, for a club coach to go and watch, you know, and have their athletes watch um, university volleyball, you know, I, I can guarantee you if I were to ask my, my, my team, and these guys are playing or practicing every day, um, you know, who are the top five players at their position internationally? I don't think half my players could answer that question. Very but good. if I were to ask them who the starting five players are on, a, on the LA Lakers, probably 100% of the athletes would know that. I use this example all the time to my, to my guys. And it's because they, they, you know, they follow athletes in other sports more than they follow athletes in their own sport. And it's because, uh, and I think it's, it's less true now, but it was definitely more true when I was younger. Um, our sport wasn't as accessible. Now it's mm -hmm. super accessible through the internet. Um, but I don't think um, whether it's coaches or athletes being self-driven to those, uh, to those sources, they don't really, they don't have role models in their sport. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? They might look up to somebody that they're playing with or yeah. uh, know that play the sport, but they don't not, it's not through a process of like this person who I don't know, but I, I really like the way they play. You know, there's very few examples of that I find um, today, and that, and that to me is a is is a problem. They can't, they don't, they, if they and if coaches aren't watching good volleyball, and you can't expect players to be either. Yeah, I think that's huge. I, I think our our national teams have done a much better job of being like visible to the to the general public, and certainly to the volleyball community, even in the last like five six years, maybe even the lead up to Rio, like. You know, a lot more of our athletes know who the, who our own athletes are on our own national teams as well as international. And volleyball TV is free right now, I believe, uh, to anybody who wants to access it. So anybody who's watching and wants to watch more volleyball, that's usually where World League and, you know, any FIVB events and high-level volleyball is uh, is usually there and you have to pay for membership, but it's free right now. So you can check that out. Um, but yeah, again, the big takeaway I'm hearing is, is asking questions seeking more information, seeking the why into what, what coaches are doing. And I know both of your gyms are, are always open door to, to coaches who want to come in and have a look. I know you guys do that all the time. I've been in there. John's been in there. You know, lots of club coaches and provincial team coaches have been invited into your gym. So, so thank you for that, for, for keeping your own environments accessible to, to inquiring minds. And I think even within our club communities, I think that that's, that's something that we don't do enough of. We don't go into the gym of the 15 year coach and our, if I coach 17, I don't go into the 18 and the 15 year or 16 year gym to see what they're doing and create that kind of lineage in, in between a club other than wearing the same jersey. So I think that's, that's an opportunity that's out there for other coaches um, um, to learn from and, and to, to share information. And, you know, sometimes you can feel like you're on your own Island when you're coaching, you're, you're in a gym, you know, on your own or with your own team and you might never ever see anybody else other than at a competition and it can feel pretty lonely uh it can feel pretty isolating it can feel uh make you feel not confident because you don't you know it's it's a little intimidating to invite someone else into your gym um but opening those doors a little bit more i think there's a lot of learning that can take place here in our province for sure there's lots of great people out there involved in our sport my favorite question it's time this is okay. our this is john and i's a question we have developed <laughs> it's very high level very very intelligent uh driven what is or are your top one to two nova scotia restaurants 
Dan, your first. Well, you already know the the answer, so you're. <laughs> well, just, I, yeah, but our, our membership doesn't know the answer. <laughs> What's number two then after sushi shige? <laughs> shige, not shige. Um, cool. Yeah, so yeah, anyone who spent any time with me and asked starts talking to me about food this the conversation tends to go in in some fun directions but um yeah so uh, you know before the pandemic of course uh my favorite restaurant locally uh sushi shige just reopened mm -hmm. uh at a at a new location on almond street uh, just off of um um i've got just off of Goddard or Barrington. Anyways, it's um, a new location for them, and they are open for for takeout. And um, it's the most authentic uh, Japanese uh, experience. Really, it's the only authentic, in my opinion. Uh, the, the chef there's uh, trained old school way, twelve years in, in Japan, uh, to to learn how to do these things properly. Um, I won't try to say anything negative about uh, the number of other places that are, that are around there. Um, I just would say that there's, there's a fairly sizable gap between that place and anywhere else um, in, in, in HRM, at least I can't speak for the rest of Nova Scotia because I'd have to eat at more places to, to make that, that statement. Um, but I guess to answer John's question, the number two place, I mean, um, the places that I would be going to before, uh, things got kind of shut down. Um, I'd say Ronaldo's uh, Italian uh, mm -hmm. place on um, on Windsor Street um, yeah. is a is a good place. Um, highly recommended. And then um, I don't eat out that much, but Michelle would even understand. Like Daryl's, uh, a local a local place here, just around the corner from from where I live, and uh, often where I take players, uh, a, little, a lot more affordable probably than the other options. And certainly it's, it's a very, very popular spot, still open, does, uh, has a, a pretty well set up for, for takeout. So, uh, peanut butter burger, I think can't go wrong. <laughs> peanut butter burger is definitely a, a staple and I, probably my top two, three choices there. So, um, awesome. so Thank those you. would be my, my two, three. We're gonna get Michelle? those. All those oh. restaurants are gonna be sponsors for the next. Episode. <laughs> Better be. <laughs> Michelle, you're so. in. You're in Port Williams, right? Yeah. So, so Valley your... Valley Living. Um, yep. If you Ditto. have not been to the Naked Crepe, that is a must stop place. It doesn't matter breakfast, lunch, or dinner. They've got a menu of crepes that you could go repeatedly for seven straight days and not not have the same uh, meal. So Naked Crepe. And then has anyone Their been pizza to pizza is good too. Pizza actually. is unbelievable. Yeah. Johnny's burgers in yes. Berwick. Yes. My goodness. So I good. just established that that was like a place. It's a little box car on the side of the road. Yep. I've only been two or three times, but oh my one of the best burgers, burgers by shakes. far. Yeah. It's good stuff. Morgan Snow. Like Morgan Snow, yeah. friend of the show, Morgan Snow, we yeah. excited to hear you mention Berwick. For sure. <laughs> and uh, Michelle, could you tell us like how many consecutive days in a row have you been to the Naked Crepe? What's your top number? Uh, it depends like recruiting season. You just go like <laughs> one after the, oh, we're going to the Naked Crepe again. Oh, next day, Naked Crepe. <laughs> You're friends with, we're friends with the owner, so. <laughs> okay, but I will say this and I don't know what this says about my personality. I get the same thing every time. I do too. I, I don't. I haven't even. I haven't even tasted the the menu. I get the steak because I don't. I don't want to be disappointed. The breakfast crepe, bacon yeah, and egg. Me too. It's so good. Simple with hollandaise with sauce, maple syrup. Oh no! No. Okay, we're in a fight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Amazing. I know if uh, anybody out there is like me, I'm tired of doing dishes. I'm <laughs> cooking every meal at home now is uh, is a struggle. So those are definitely some great restaurants for people to check out while we're, uh, we're in a pandemic. I know most of them, I think maybe except Naked Crepe are open um, and doing, uh, doing takeout. So get out there and support our local restaurants, peeps. There's lots of good stuff happening. Um, but thank you so much uh, to Michelle Wood and Dan Oda for giving us your time today, um, as well as sharing your, your knowledge with all of us, um, as well as everybody who gets the time to, to view this maybe two-part episode given that we're, we're approaching our second hour here um so thanks guys so much for for being involved today